Okay, well, we were interrupted by an unscheduled absence of mine, so we missed a day, so I'm not sure. I think we're pretty well ahead. I mean, in pretty good shape in terms of not being able to, not having to lag too far behind. At the end of class last time, uh, we had, we've been doing some of this PEP9 CPU um, exercises, problems, um, to actually implement some code to, to write some code to implement some ISA3 instructions. And so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at the control section side. So let's go back here and review figure 12.2. In figure 12.2, you know we have the register bank at the top, we have the A bus and the B bus, we know information goes down through the ALU and up into the register bank, or it can come from memory and be injected into that loop, or it can go from the loop and be injected into memory. And so that's the way, this is kind of the way all the information flows. And what we've been doing is we have been setting these control signals in order to do what we need to do. And on this figure, 12.2, all, all these control signals are coming from the right-hand side. You know, whoosh, they're all being, they manipulate. It's like the Fed tries to manipulate the economy, but they're not quite so successful as we are manipulating <laughs> the data structure. <laughs> little political economic commentary there. Okay, so um, we are much more successful than they are. So it's manipulating, you know, control. It's all about power control. <laughs> so, but now the question is, have you ever wondered what was behind that curtain? Let's take a look and see how it is that you can in fact set up the control section to produce those signals to do the flow, the data flow that you need in order to implement an ISA3 instruction. So the topic here is the PEP9 control section. And um, here is a summary of the main ideas behind the PEP9 control section. Now let me hasten to add that it's beyond the scope of the course to see how you would actually do this in the hardware. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how it works. So you, but conceptually, I think you can see how it works. Now, let's just think about this for a minute. This is really fascinating. This is really a fascinating <coughs> deal. What are you doing when you write a sequence of microcode statements? You are basically doing what? You're writing a program. And each one, of those, each one of those statements is a statement that controls the data section. But it's one statement, ex executes after another one, executes after another one, executes after another one. Well look, if it's a program, then what does it need? Interpreter. Well, yeah, but at the hardware level, what, I mean, how, how, have you, does it, the, yeah, von Neumann, fetch the next micro, you know, you know, fetch the next micro instruction, decode the next micro instruction, execute the next micro instruction, repeat, because it's a sequence, it goes boom, 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 it repeats. Are you with me? So look, you guys, basically what we have is, we have to have a sequence of instructions to be executed, right? So where are they stored? Not in main memory, but in what? Micro memory. Are you with me? So we had this UMEM, that stands for micro memory. That's the microcode read-only memory. So we have a separate little area on the chip for micro memory and then we have a instead of having a program counter we have a what a micro program counter are you with me this is not the program counter at ISA 3 this is the program counter at what MIC 2 
micro code two level. Are you with me? So there's a memory, so there's a micro memory, a micro program counter, and instead of having an instruction register at ISA three, what do we have? A, yeah, yeah, a micro code instruction register. And then instead of having a von Neumann cycle at level ISA three, what do we have? A micro von Neumann cycle. Are you with me? You see the idea there? Okay, now here's the thing. At this microcode level, we, the whole thing is speed. We want each one of these to execute, each micro instruction to execute in one cycle. So there's no, there's no increment part of the cycle that has to happen separately. Okay, every micro instruction contains the address of the in next instruction to execute. Okay, so that's typically the way we're going to do it, or the way it's done. And here in figure 12.15 is a high level schematic diagram of what the micro von Neumann cycle, of how the micro von Neumann cycle is implemented. So now, you, now first of all, if, you take a, if we take a look at the, um, that row of arrows on the left that are pointing towards the left, do you recognize each one of those? Load CK, C, B, A, M, A, R, C, K, M, D, R, C, K, A, M, X, M, D, R, M, X, blah, 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 S, S, C, K, C, C, K, V, C, K, blah, blah. You recognize those? Each one of those is a what? Input. Is an input of the data section. All right? And where do each one of those things come from? They come from down here on the bottom right. What is this? This is the what? Micro instruction, instruction register. So the micro instruction register is what, and if you count them up, there's 34 of them. I don't, did we ever count those up? I don't remember. If you count them, there's 34 of them. And this micro instruction register sends those signals to do that. Are you with me? And then, in the middle, on the right here, there is this 2 to the k by n bit micro memory, which is read-only memory. And up at the top, there is the micro program counter. And then in the upper left is the decode <coughs> branch unit, is the decoder slash branch unit. Because here's the thing. Um, that we have kind of glossed over in our implementations of our ISA 3 instructions. We never have, I never have given you an assignment to execute a conditional branch instruction. Do you see what I mean? Because, you know, like an example of a conditional branch instruction is like, is like BRN. I'm uh, sorry, BR, BREQ. So this is an example of a conditional branch instruction at ISA 3, BREQ. And how does BREQ work? Well, it has to do, it has to test the, ENZ, the NZVC bits, right? And so, um, and if the condition is satisfied, it puts something into the program counter Otherwise, it doesn't. So that means that in order to execute this instruction at the um, at the MIC2 level, we have to have a way to to get some data from the um, data section and figure out in the instruction whether to do whether to branch or not. Are you with me? And so that's and so that those twelve lines coming into the decoder slash branch unit are the uh, first we, we have the B bus coming in and we also have the NZVC bits coming in. And those those lines uh, we need that information in order to know whether or not to execute a branch or just go on and not not execute a branch. And all those details are beyond the scope of this, 
I mean, there are really interesting little bit twiddling techniques to do that, but that's beyond the scope of this course. But anyway, what, but what you can, what, what we see then is that, is that this, uh, this micro memory just fetches the next micro instruction. It just goes and goes and goes and goes. And each time one of these, each time one of these executes in one cycle, then it causes one, it, each, each time one of these executes, it's one cycle, it's one ISA3 cycle. And here is a picture, this micro instruction register here in figure 12.16 shows the micro instruction format. So there's, um, in general, there's going to be 34 bits of this instruction and each one of those 34 bits on the, the rightmost 34 bits, each one of those 34 bits is a is attached to a control line. You see how that works? So this is, it's attached to a control line and and then I, I just, we just, the whole instruction is n bits wide and n is, uh, it's beyond the scope of this course to actually do it. So, so n is, n, so n we don't know what the value of n is, but whatever it is. Because another way to do this is to have a finite state machine implemented directly. I don't know if you can visualize this or not. But another, instead of having a micro code or a micro program <coughs> with a micro instruction register and a micro program counter, and instead of, setting it, instead of doing it this way, you could actually have a finite state machines. You could have a big finite state machine and do this whole thing dir directly without having it organized this way. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you can visualize how that would work. And now, you guys, I actually have a show and tell. So our next slide here, this I just put this on I, I, I just put this on in um, an hour or two ago into my slides. What I'm going to show you now is this, this was back in 1980, if you can believe this. What I have here, I'm going to pass here, let me pass these around. I have these cards. But here, let me, let me tell you a little bit of history. <coughs> the Mo Motorola, have you guys heard of Motorola? Are they, I think they're still around. They make, uh, yeah. Oh, really? The Google Mo Oh, okay, I wasn't. For Android. Probably. Ah, yeah. But anyway, I have these, I have these cards here, and I, I, I have it up on the slide here. This is the Motorola 68000. And the reason they called it the Motorola 68000 is because they were real proud of the fact that they were able to squeeze in 68,000 transistors onto a single chip. All right, and um, there's and what they did is they did a, when they did their man, one of their manufacturing runs, they took the defect. You know, some of the chips are defective, and so they pasted them on this promotional card, and the chip itself is right there. So this is what this is what's inside the you know the pa the packages that we use in the lab. This is actually a picture of a chip that's inside the lab. Now I'm going to pass this loop around also. I have here a little eyepiece of the loop. And you got to, to use it, you got to go real close. You got to go way like that. I can actually see the defect on this chip. You may or may, it may not, may or may not be visible. But this, I mean, this is 1980. This is like 80, 92,000, This is more than 30 years ago. All right, but it was a big deal to have 68,000 transistors on a chip. But now look what's amazing about this. Can you see, they show you, this was a, not, this was a micro-coded chip. Can you see the, it's in the upper left part. Do you see it has mu ROM? Do you see that on the card? It's right here. It's right up here. This part, can you hear that? That's the micro ROM. That's the ROM where the micro code is stored. But look, what's amazing is what do you see in the bottom part of that figure? This is the micro ROM, but what does this say? Uh, what do you think that is? What do you think N ROM is? 
just think about levels of abstraction. Nano-ROM. Nano-ROM. Okay. So instead of having seven typical levels with a microcode level, there's also a what? A nanocode level. So this had two levels of abstraction. And so what happened is several nano instructions could do a micro instruction, which would several of which would do a ISA3 instruction. And they were, uh, so th this was a very common, this was a very common uh, technique and they, e they even took it one extra level in this, in the manufacture of Motorola 68000. So what are some of those others? There's the ALU, so you, you can see the ALU control unit there and the control unit, the, the address decode areas, the address high execution unit, the address low execution unit, the data execution unit. And here they're bragging. In the not too distant past, this much circuitry would have required as much space as a typical refrigerator and nearly as much cooling capacity. So it was a really hot product at the time. And as a matter of fact, um, the Apple computer went with the Motorola 68000. And then they switched. I can remember when this happened. They used the Motorola 68000 in their original, their original Mac. And uh, it wasn't Intel, you know. It was a newer, better version. And then they switched, then they made a big change. They switched to the, uh, we're gonna, we're, in a few days, we're gonna start talking about RISC architecture, which is, um, this is an example of CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computer Design. In the future, we're gonna talk about RISC. They switched to a RISC chip, which was the PowerPC that was manufactured by IBM. And finally, they just threw in the towel and they said, you know, compatibility, we need compatibility. And so they went with Intel because they needed compatibility with Windows. And so now I can use, use Windows on boot camp and do a boot and everything like that. So, so they've got, um, so they, basically what they did is they went from CISC to RISC and then back to CISC again. <laughs> it's a crazy history. But for the mobile phones, they're, I mean, for all the mobile devices, Intel is, does, does not, it's the ARM chip that dominates uh, mobile devices. So now, now they're back to risk in, with the mobile devices. It's really, really interesting. So you can give those back to me after class, uh, when the class is over. All right. Um, so that's the story about, about uh, CISC. Oh, about microcode. Also, um, Later on in the chapter, I have a little section here in the fifth edition of the book that shows how the microcode works, a little example of how microcode works in the Intel chip that you might be interested in reading. Okay, now, next up is this big question of how do we increase performance. Now, what's the big trade-off that's the key to everything? Space-time space -time, trade-off. So basically, but the way to increase performance is to increase the space, you know, increase space. Um, which, should which should help us to decrease time. And there's, um, these, there are three primary ways to increase the performance, and we're going to take a look at all three of these, and they're all very common, and they're, so, and it's really, we need to understand how these three performance enhancing techniques play out in modern processors. The first thing, the first way to do this, one primary way to do this, is to increase the data bus width. Now, how big is our, you know, on the system bus, how big is the data bus that we've been doing so far? It's one byte. It's one byte. The address bus is two bytes, but the data bus is only one byte. And you know, whenever we have to get a word from memory, how do we have to do it? One at a time, yeah, retrieve one at a time, and then wait three, and then retrieve, yeah. 
So one way we could speed things up is to widen the data bus. Now this raises a whole host of really of issues, and we and that's that's going to be uh, we're going to look at those issues. Another way to increase it is to now. Do you guys you guys have heard of cash, right? I mean, they actually the cash memory they advertise. You know, chip manufacturers advertise their chips by bragging about how big their caches are and how fast they are. So, a, what is a cache? Colloquially speaking. Have you ever heard the expression like he has a cache of jewels or a cache of cash, <laughs> money, cache of money? C -A, it's a C A C H E. Yeah, it's where you. Yeah, in a in a computer system, it is a, it is a, a storage. It is storage. Well, I noticed that. Colloquially speaking, a cache is a storage for your valuables, right? In a computer system, what it is is it is a when you fetch information from memory, you fetch more than what you need and you bring it into a high-speed cache so that the next time you have to fetch from memory, you don't have to go all the way to memory. You can go to the cache and get it there instead. So it's prefetching more than what you need and putting it in the cache so that the next time you go to um, access memory, you can check to see if it's in the cache first if it is, you don't have to go all the way to memory. So it's a copy. It contains a copy of what's in memory. And it's between the CPU and memory. So, it's, so the storage capacity is what compared to main memory. The storage capacity of cache is what compared to main memory? Greater or smaller? Smaller, right? But on the other hand, is it faster or slower? Faster. So you can afford to make it fast. Okay. Static RAM. Okay, so that's the second way to increase performance. And the third really common way to increase performance that we need to understand is pipelining. Now, we've already done hardware parallelism. Where have we seen hardware parallelism before? Registers and CPU and doing, yeah, if they don't use the same resources, we can do them at the same time. That's, pipelining is that, is another example of doing that. You engineer your CPU so that you can do having so that you can have different parts of the of the of the CPU doing their things at the same time because they don't need to re do they don't need to they don't have resources that conflict. So we're going to go through each one of these three things and that'll take us to the end of the chapter basically. So first, how can we increase the data bus width? All right, are you guys ready for this? Drum roll. Here's the next big figure. Figure 12.17. Check this out, sports fans. First of all, the figure is too big to show the register bank at the top. Okay, so just assume that that's there. That's the same. That part's unchanged. And also, it's too big to show the memory, the main memory on the left side of the system bus, but that part's the same. Well, I take it back. That part is not the same. <laughs> that part has to be modified a little bit. We'll see how it has to be modified. But the register bank is identically, is, is definitely identical. Now, what do you notice about the system bus on the left? You see the address part is on the left, and what do you see about the data part? It's just as wide as the address part. So this is our example of a two-byte data bus. Uh, everything that we say here is going to apply to four-byte data bus, eight-byte eight data bus, 16-byte, you know. All the issues are basically the same. We're going to investigate in detail the two-byte data bus. So that's one big difference. Now what about the lower right-hand side? Do you see the ALU, the CS mucks? The CMUX, the ANZ, the NZVC, shadow bit, blah, 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 all that stuff on the lower right, all that's the same. But think about it for a minute. What did we have in our original one byte, bit, one byte data bus? How did, where did the data come, when the, when the data came from memory, where did it go? 
It went into the what? No, when it came from, when we did a memory read and we, and we read something from memory, where did it? Here, let's go back and look. Here, here okay, here's figure 12.2. Oh, into the MDR. It went through, look, there's the memory, and you see that it's a one byte data bus, and it went through the MDR mux into the what? MDR. MDR. Now, what is the MDR? The memory data register. <coughs> data register. If we're going to have a two byte data bus, and the whole idea is to get two bytes at a time, we're going to need what? Not just one byte MDR, we're going to need what? It's going to have to be two bytes. Are you with me? So let's go to our two byte data bus. So now look, do you see that? So now do you see what the two MDRs? There's an MDR odd and an MDR even. Are you with me? So those two MDRs, why do we have to have two MDRs? Because to speed this thing up, we're going to get two bytes at concurrently, two bytes at the same time. And they're going to go into the MDR odd and MDR even. Are you with me? Does everybody see how that does everybody see how that works? So now you understand now that what this is going to do is this is going to affect the memory subsystem. Because now the memory is going to have to be designed to be able to put two bytes, two adjacent bytes, onto the bus at the same time. And why do you suppose we call these two memory data registers MDR even and MDR odd? Why do you suppose they're named MDR even and MDR odd? And by the way, there's an MDR E mux and an MDR O mux. Do you see how to, to get them into the you see what I'm saying? Instead of just an MDR mux, there's an MDR E mux and an MDR O mux. So what do you, what's, what do you suppose is even and odd? Yeah. What, what quantity do you think is even and odd? Zero. Well, if, 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 a, if a binary value ends in zero, it's even. And if a binary value ends in one, it is odd. That's a good, that's a nice observation. But what quantity do you think is even and odd? What do you think? It's the addresses. That's right. It's the addresses. So look, the way this is set up is that only a byte at an even address will go into MDR even, and only a byte from an odd address will go into MDR odd. It's the address that is either even or odd. Does everybody see how that works? And we'll, uh, we'll go into this in more detail in a minute. Another slide coming up later. All right, so now let's, let's see, let's see how, how this is modified compared to figure 12 point, to, to our original figure. <clears throat> so, we have, oh, and by the way, instead of just having an MDR MUX control line, now we have an MDR O MUX and an MDR E MUX. And again, it's left and right. Zero is left, one is right. Does everybody see how that works? And we have an MDR O C K and an MDR E C K, so we can clock those in separately. Or we can do them at the same time. Right? Because, this, because now we're doing these in parallel, both bytes in parallel. And now, what about in our previous, here, let's go back to our previous figure 12.2. Here, let's go back to figure 12.2. Do you see the CMUX? Now, CMUX can either come from where or from where, coming up through the bottom. CMUX comes, can come from where or where? Can either come from what? On the left, what's the left input to the CMUX? Oh, the, uh, yeah, the yeah, the the yeah, the yeah, the yeah, the the status bits, and then on the right, it's coming through the what? Coming from the what? ALU. From the ALU, and now it goes up to the C bus, right? <clears throat> but it can also be diverted into the what? On the left, it can be the output of the C mux can be diverted into the what? MDR MDR mux. Well, what do we have now? What? Now where can it be diverted? 
Now, now, see, not only can it go up into the C bus, now it can be diverted either into the what or the what? MDR. E, e mux or the MDR O mux. Yeah, either one. So that's natural extension. All right. And now let's go back to figure 12.2 and draw another. This is, you, you know how your teachers used to always make you write an essay called <coughs> Compare and Contrast? <laughs> you know, I used to hate those. <laughs> anyway, we're comparing and contrasting. <laughs> the one, di one byte data bus and the two byte data bus. Okay, so now look. In figure 12.2 with the one byte data bus, how did we get the, the, the MDR, the content of the MDR, back up into the register bank? How did we do that? It would go through the what? AMUX. The AMUX through the ALU, through the CMUX, and then back up to the register bank, right? But now we don't just have one MDR, we have how many? Two. We have two MDRs. So how are we going to get those two? How are we going to know which one goes through? We're going to need another what? How does MDR even get get to go through the ALU? It 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 goes through a what? The EO mux. The EO mux. Now, what is the E? Because because what else can the, can come through the EO mux? MDR odd. Do you see that? Here's actually there's an expanded one on the slides here. See, look. <clears throat> MDR even can come through the EO mux, which can get, then go through the AMUX, which can then go through the ALU. Or MDR odd can go through the EO mux, which can go through the AO mux, which can go through the ALU. But the ALU is still only eight, it's still only one byte. The ALU is still only one byte. Does everybody see that, how that works? Basically, we have to duplicate you know, we have to duplicate the MDR, the memory data register, and make an MDR even and an MDR odd. And then we have to duplicate the MDR muxes, the MDR e mux and the MDR o mux. <clears throat> and then we have to have, and we need another, <clears throat> we need this EO mux to select which byte gets through to the AL, gets through the ALU and goes back up to the register bank. Right? Is everybody with me on this? Now, so that's one aspect of the two-byte data bus. Now there's another really big aspect of this two-byte data bus that makes it work really, really slick. That really improves the performance. Do you guys remember that time we did that torturous indirect addressing? Do you remember that? And what did, because how big is an address? Two, an, address is, an, an address is two bytes. Now check this out, you guys. This is a really slick feature of this two-byte data bus. Do you remember when we did that indirect addressing, we had, we had to take the, the bytes and we had to, first we had to get them and then we had to put them up into the register bank and then we had to get the next byte and we had to put that up into the register bank and then, and then, and then if, that was the, if that was an address, we had to then put those back, later on we had to put those into the what? Memory address <coughs> register because they were addresses. Are you with me? Well, look in figure 12.17. Look at what we have here. We have a way to go, because now that we have two memory data registers, we have a shortcut. And this, they do this, hardware engineers are cognizant of this all the time. We're just going to build ourselves a little shortcut and be able to take those two bytes in the memory data registers and s instead of having to go one byte at a time up to the register bank, we're gonna just do what? Have them both be able to go, where, can you tell here? Where we can send them? The Through the MAR mux and into the what? MAR. MAR. In one cycle, both bytes, without having to go all the way up, instead of having to go the even byte up to the register bank, the odd byte up into the register bank, that's two cycles, and then in one cycle into the MAR, so that's three cycles. In one cycle, we can go straight from both what? MDR even and MDR odd into the 
MAR. So look, here, here it is on this exploded uh, version. So here's MDR even. So not only can it go through the EO mugs and down here and down here through the ALU and you know, go up to the register bank, but look what else can you do. It can go up. MDR even can go up. MDR odd can go up. And this MAR MUX is a two byte MUX. And so they can be presented to MARA and MARB and boom, we've got our shortcut. Does everybody see how that works? So that is, <clears throat> that's a new little shortcut route for us. All right. Now, that big fat square MAR MUX, that is, here are the control lines for that. The MDR MUX control signals. So, because, but here, let's go back. What is our usual convention? Our usual convention is that um, on a MUX, what's our usual convention for a MUX? L left, zero means what? Left. left input, one means what? Right, right input. So. What's the, what's the problem, you know, like here? Zero on EO MUX means coming from MDR even. One on EO MUX says that we're coming from MDR odd. But what's the problem with, what's the problem with our convention up here? This MAR MUX. I mean, yeah, well, one of the inputs is coming from the bottom and the other one's coming from the right. So we don't have left and right, we have bottom and right. Do you see what I'm saying? So what do you suppose it is? Zero bottom. Zero bottom, yeah. So here it is on this slide. So zero on the MAR MUX routes MDR even to MDR A and MDR odd to M MAR B. Are you with me? So if we look at it, it's like it just turns a little corner here. But anyway, zero on <clears throat> zero, zero takes it from the bottom and one takes it to the top. I mean, one takes it from the right. <laughs> okay? So anyway, does everybody understand how that works? That's just a shortcut. Now, now this has really, really big implications. Um, first implication is, is this. Let's go back to, our, um, to this figure 12.17. Suppose the CPU wants to read a byte from memory. Let's suppose that we are implementing, let's suppose that we are doing um, load byte accumulator this direct. Suppose that this instruction is executing. Now, the CPU <coughs> could be asking for a byte at an even address, or it could be asking for a byte at a what? At an odd address. Are you with me? So the question is, what two bytes get delivered to M MDR even and MDR odd? Well look. Look at this memory read table. Let's suppose that the CPU requests the byte at 0AB6. Now is this 0AB6, is that even or odd? Is 0AB6 even or odd? Even. It's even. So what's it going to do? It's going to put 0AB6 at MDR even and the next one 0AB7 at MDR odd because it's going to it's going to deliver two bytes. If we only add access, if we only ask for one, it's, that's how it's going to do it. If we ask for the one at zero A B seven, what's it going to do? It's going to deliver zero A B seven to M D R odd. But then, at, but then also, it's going to deliver what? So A B six to even. And if we ask for zero A B eight, what's it going to do? It's going to put the zero A B eight here and the zero A B nine here. If it, but if it asks for zero A B nine, it's also going to do zero A B eight and zero A B nine here. Are you with me? So, do you see that it? If we ask for zero A B six or zero A B seven, it's the same thing. 
It's going to deliver, the, as far as the memory subsystem is concerned, it's going to deliver the exact same thing. So we don't even have to tell the memory subsystem the last bit. Do you see what I mean? We don't even have to tell it that because it's going to do the same thing. It's going to ignore that and it's going to do the, the even one and the odd one. Are you with me? So look, uh, we'll close with this and then we'll, we will... So put this in your pipe and smoke it. <clears throat> look, on the left, this figure 12.19, do you see this chip uh, in part A, the chip of figure 12.2? How many address lines does it have? Zero, one, zero, 16. Are you with me? And how many data lines does it have? Eight. All right? But now look at the chip for B. Look at part B. How many address lines does it have? Yeah, what's missing? The least significant bit. But how many data lines does it have? 16. So we don't even have to tell it what A0 is because it's going to deliver the same 16 bits anyway. Does that, you see how that works? So you can actually, in the, so they're, even though the address has that extra bit, in a real physical system, all the, the low order lines, address lines, they can just be missing. There's no reason for them to put the copper at it because it doesn't matter, so they just leave it out. Anyway, we'll continue this madness tomorrow. All right.